Okay, let's uh, get started. Good evening. I'm Ping Liang, a very proud member of the World Affairs Council and past board president. Thank you all for coming. Tonight we will have a very exciting discussion on Brazil. Before we begin, let me take care of some council's business. As most of you are current members of the World Affairs Council, so we want to thank you most sincerely for your support of our programs. And we want to share with you a very exciting news as well. Uh, this evening, we just got our 1,000th member, general member, uh, and his name is John Halbeck. Is that correct? John, would you please stand? Let's welcome him. Please. Um, just this afternoon, we were talking about the general membership. We said 999. Just one more. And there John is. So thank you, John. And we are so delighted to share that good news with all of you. Um, we encourage all of you to share uh, information about our council with your family and friends. As you know, they can also sign up for free, free email memberships through our website, which is world, W-O-R-L-D, Michigan, and I don't need to spell that, dot org. So it's all together, worldmichigan.org. This way, you know, they will be able to receive regular updates about the council's great program offerings. So as you know, it's through our generous, very generous sponsors, we're able to bring you quality programs like today's. Tonight, we want to thank our Great Decision Series media sponsor, WGVU, as well as this evening's sponsors, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum, whose representative, Jim Kratzis, is here with us. Jim, where are you? Please stand, be recognized. And the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, whose representative, Joe Cavaruso, is also here tonight. Joe, where are you? Here we go, yeah. So we thank them most sincerely for their support of the World Affairs Council and all our programs. As you may have heard in previous programs, Kathy Dopp, are you here? Kathy, just raise your hand. And uh, her group is called the Expats and Cultural Explorers Meetup Group. They will meet after Great Decision Program at local bars and restaurants um, for further informal discussions. So tonight, they will be meeting immediately after the program at Sanchez on Fulton Street downtown. So you please feel free to join them. Now, let's turn to tonight's topic. After 40 years of military rule, followed by economic trouble, a more modern and democratic Brazil has risen to global prominence. It's drawing in more investments, expanding exports, working on issues, and hosting major sporting events on the global stage. But some of Brazil's trickiest problems, such as government corruption and income inequality, have held it back. Can Brazil overcome these problems and enter the ranks of advanced democracies? We hope to get some answers tonight. We are very honored to have Ambassador Melvin Levinsky with us tonight to talk about Brazil, always on the edge of greatness. But will it get there? So Ambassador Levinsky, is a retired career foreign service officer. He is right now a professor of international policy and practice at the University of Michigan. It's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. He had 35 years career as a US diplomat. Ambassador Levinsky was a ambassador for United States to Brazil as well as the Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics Matters. 
He was also the U.S. Ambassador to Bulgaria and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. So obviously, um, Ambassador has a very long career, and he has taught at uh, schools such as uh, Syracuse Maxwell School of Government, as well as uh, SICE. We call it SICE, Johns Hopkins. Um, and um, you know, due to time, I'm not going to uh, you know, uh, detail his career, uh, brilliant career. I think you can all read about it. So let's uh, uh, you know, welcome uh, Ambassador Levinsky right now for a presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I've been going back and forth with Ms. Donna Kramer here on uh, this, and I mentioned to her when I was asked to speak about Brazil that it was very opportune, because uh, last week we just got back from a, I took 22 students on a, on a study trip uh, to Brazil. We went to Brasilia and to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that class because it's a very interesting kind of experience. It's, it's experiential learning. Uh, the students, uh, it's a student-driven course. The students at the um, Ford School ask a, um, an instructor, a faculty member, a year before if uh, that faculty member would uh, be the student, be the faculty advisor uh, and they pick a country and they vote on a country. So Brazil won this year. I was the, asked to be the faculty advisor. And we've been studying uh, Brazil for, actually before this semester began in January, we had some talks uh, from some visiting Brazilians at the, at the university. So they've been exploring Brazil and then during our spring, or I guess it's winter break since it was minus degrees in Michigan when we, at uh, Ann Arbor when we left, um, they went and uh, furthered their research. So it was a research study trip. They divided themselves into five groups. So the groups were econo microeconomics, essentially, and they also looked at the Olympics and what effect the Olympics and the World Cup had on Brazil's economy. There's a mixed picture there. Uh, social policy, where they looked at both, uh, they looked at race and how um, policy, social, policy, uh, social policy in the favelas, the the cities, the urban slums in Rio de Janeiro uh, were uh, affected by race and how they affected uh, racial issues in Brazil. There was an environmental group that was looking at greenhouse gas em emissions. These are all graduate students, by the way. A security group that looked at um, a new kind of community policing that they're doing in Brazil, particularly in the favelas, a lot of it in connection with the, uh, the coming Olympics. Um, and, uh, and so these groups um, study, did their, their studies and their research, and then they made their own appointments. I helped them a little uh, since I knew some people there, but basically they ran, they ran their own course. It was quite an experience. Uh, now, the main thing I took away from it is that coming from minus 9 degrees to plus 90 with 90% 90 humidity can do some wear on you if you're an older person it even wore on some of the students, actually. Uh, but we were in Rio. We had a uh, really productive time, met at the university, met with NGOs, uh, civil society organizations, some of the government organizations, went into the favelas themselves and met with some people there and some non-governmental people that were doing it. So I feel pretty current in the way things um, are um, happening in Brazil and what the public attitudes are, and we can talk about this. So I'm going to talk for a bit about Brazil and then open it up for questions. I'm told that this is a very eager group to ask questions. I hope they will be pro probing and provocative. Um, I served in Brazil uh, in the late 60s at a small consulate we had, Belém, which translates from Portuguese into English as Bethlehem, by the way, but it was not a... I thought, actually, when I was assigned there, I didn't know about it, I thought it was, Bed I thought it was the name of it was Bedlam. It was, it's on the mouth of the Amazon, about a degree from the equator, and um, we had a small consulate there, a couple of foreign service officers, a USIA officer, um, information agency, which has since been combined into the State Department. 
And the Amazon, uh, the whole Amazon was our consular district, so I had a chance to uh, uh, travel around, uh, do some American citizen services things, because we did have Americans living in some of the cities, especially a group of missionaries that were out with the, um, the native uh, tribes, teaching them, actually teaching the Bible. They're called the Wycliffe Bible Translators. If you've never heard of them, you could Google them. It's a very interesting group. They believed, it was an evangelical group, they believed that uh, to get to heaven, uh, you must be able to read the Bible. So they went out among the tribes, 350 different languages, and a relatively small population, maybe half a million of uh, native, uh, native uh, indigenous people, and they learned the language of each of these uh, places that they went. Then they translated the language into a written form. Then they taught the written language to the people in the village, in the villages, the people that spoke that language. Then they taught them to read the Bible. This would take 20 years in some cases, in very remote places. Um, so we had a number of Americans around, and uh, one of the, the fascinating things I found is going through the Amazon and seeing the size and the breadth uh, gave me a sense of sort of the, the kind of destiny that Brazil sees for themselves. It's a big country. It's a country that has big aspirations. You know, they have, a, a, uh, they have an expression, Deus é brasileiro, God is Brazilian. And so they have that kind of outward-looking sense that they're, that they're destined for great things. And so if you look at the title, this has been the sort of common wisdom. Still, the, is Brazil's this country of the future and it'll always be so. Never quite makes it. So one of the things I want to explore with you is how are they doing and are they, are they getting there, which is the title, which is the title of the talk. Um, I want to do a little bit of historical review. I have left some um, uh, copies of the PowerPoint if you want to get into more detail, but I think the historical review is just to kind of give us the context of uh, how Brazil got where it is today and what kind of uh, history it has, uh, what kind of travails it's gone through, what kind of challenges it's faced over the years. So let's just just get an idea of uh, Brazil is a big part of Latin America. Uh, in fact, just one little uh, fact, the Brazilian economy is equal to all the economies of the countries around it, in South America at least. So, uh, so let me go to something else here. So, whoops. So Sao Paulo, um, which is in the southern, this is Rio, and here's uh, Sao Paulo is, can't even see it. Sao Paulo is over here. There we are. Sao Paulo, the city of Sao Paulo has a larger population and a um, bigger domestic product, if you could say that, of a city than the country of Chile. The state of Sao Paulo uh, has a, as large an economy and as many people as Argentina. We were talking about a big, uh, industrialized, forward-moving country. Uh, you notice uh, the river, the river pattern, a lot of rivers in Brazil. So one, another fact to keep in mind is that Brazil ha gets 70% of its energy from hydroelectric sources, that is from the, the dams that, uh, that uh, produce the hydroelectric power. Uh, and these are the states. So Brazil has 20, 27 states, including the federal district. Um, w one thing in terms of historical terms, keep in mind too. So during most of Brazil's history, the population was around the coast. It came, original settlers came from Portugal. Portuguese were great sailors, and most of their country was on the coast too, the populated area. But uh, particularly, uh, actually a little bit before the time when I began to serve up here on the, uh, on the Amazon, um, the president of Brazil at that time, Juscelino Kubitschek, decided it was important to move the Brazil, try to have some incentive for the Brazilian population to move into the interior and begin to develop the interior. So his motto was 50 years progress in five years. And he built Brasilia out of nothing in basically five years. If you've ever seen a picture of Brasilia, it sort of reminds you of a moon colony of 
stuck out in the middle of this red clay plateau, about a uh, big plateau in the center of Brazil that is about 3,000 feet in altitude. Um, when, I, when we first went there, my wife and I and small son, it was mostly red clay around, very few trees. They were just being planted. When we came back, uh, when I came back as ambassador, uh, the city had blossomed. The city also was about five times as large as what the planters had planned for. Uh, so they were experiencing, you know, the kind of problems you have with rapid urbanization. Uh, in any case, uh, and I'll get to some of these the, the sort of downsides of that, but in any case, what happened in this area here around Brasilia is a tremendous development of agribusiness, uh, particularly in soy, cattle, uh, soybeans, cattle raising, uh, corn, all kinds of, all kinds of crops um, that um, really boosted Brazil's uh, economic potential. Uh, when we talk about infrastructure, we'll see some of the problems that it's created as well. But in any case, we want to just keep in mind, as you think about Brazil, the great area, most of the population is in this area. This is very uninhabited, and this was always, the Northeast was always the poorest area of Brazil. Okay? Now, just a few, a few little events. So, Portuguese colonized Brazil. Uh, again, a, a uh, sorry, I'm hitting the wrong thing here. Um, there was an estimate of seven to ten million indigenous peoples. Uh, now there are two to three hundred thousand. Well, we know what happened. There was, of course, a lot of uh, intermarriage and uh, uh, a lot of coupling between the Portuguese. Uh, a lot of it forced, and the local and the local uh, uh, native people. Uh, now there are two to three hundred thousand. Uh, pure um, Brazilian Indians, mostly living in the Amazon, although there are some in the south. Uh, remember the Treaty of Tortelius, you probably, some of you studied this in, in, in school, in high school, is that they basically, they didn't know what the continent looked like, but they just kind of divided it down the middle, and Portugal got the, uh, west, the eastern side, Spain got the western side. Actually, the uh, Brazilians and the Portuguese uh, expanded further than what that line was, but essentially that was supposed to be the um, that was supposed to be the cut. Um, let me go to the next. I, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but so colonization, uh, Portuguese basically started settling Brazil. Uh, they worked in mines and sugar plantations, and this required, if you look at the history. Uh, a lot of workers, many more workers than they had. At first, they used the local population uh, in, as slave labor, essentially. But then they imported a huge number of um, slaves from, from Africa, mainly from uh, Western Africa in the area that was essentially Ivory Coast, uh, Ghana, and um, uh, in large numbers many more than, in the, than uh, were imported into, into North America, uh, working in the sugarcane fields, et cetera. Most of the uh, industries that were um, important then uh, continue to be important. Very many extractive industries. That's important in terms of thinking about Brazil's exports because commodity, uh, the price of commodities has a big influence on how prosperous Brazil uh, can be. Right now the price of commodities is down, so they're suffering from that along with some other, some other problems. Why? There we go. Uh, we did have, actually in history, we had a Dutch settlement. Uh, they were driven out by the Portuguese, and many of them came up to the United States. There, in fact, um, there were a number of um, Portuguese uh, Jewish settlers, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Dutch Jewish settlers who immigrated and if you go to, um, if you're ever in uh, Rhode Island, there is a, a synagogue called, which is the oldest in the United States, called the Toro Synagogue, which was um, uh, basically founded by these uh, Dutch uh, Jewish people who um, were forced out of Brazil. So just to cover, uh, cover um, a couple of um, important um, dates here. The Portuguese royal family actually escaped 
from Europe as Napoleon came down into Iberia and ruled Portugal for about 10 years uh, from uh, Rio de Janeiro. When they went back to Portugal, they left uh, the son, Pedro I, which is, uh, you can see right here, and Brazil was ruled as, uh, by a, a king uh, until uh, 1889, which was a year after Brazil abolished slavery. It was the last country, at least in our hemisphere, to abolish slavery. And this has left a kind of mark on the population as well. Uh, Brazil then became a constitutional uh, republic, but with a very strong autocratic uh, government. And then there was a period which was basically, um, sorry, uh, what's going on here? What is that? I think <laughs> I think I came to the got to the wrong PowerPoint. Yeah, let me put it back on. Sorry about that. In any case, well, so there was a period of time when Brazil, uh, there was a military coup, and a, the um, president of Brazil was Getulio Vargas, very strong autocratic, in the same mold as uh, Franco in Spain and Salazar in, in Portugal. Very much a corporate state with the, um, the government being a kind of engine of development, and that was the concept, as the government would own uh, a lot of the means of production, but not in, in, a, in this sort of mode of, of communism, but in uh, what would be called state-led capitalism. And there's still a lot of, um, a lot of the remnants of that attitude uh, in Brazil at this particular period of time. So here's Getulio Vargas. Um, there's also a tradition in Brazil, which persists until today, of leaders who are thrown out coming back. So Getulio Vargas was actually thrown out. A more democratic government was set up, and then he ran in an election in uh, 1950 and was, uh, and was elected uh, to, his, to his post. We have some other examples of that, which I'll mention a bit later. Also important to keep in mind that Brazil was the only country in South America that actually contributed to the effort of, in World War II. So they sent about 25,000 Army, Navy, and Air Force troops. They fought in the, um, successfully in the campaign in Sicily and Italy. Um, they, we had U.S. bases in the north and northeast of Brazil that were jump-off points for North Africa during the North African campaign. And uh, I remember once when uh, we had General Shalish Kavili, if you remember, he was the, uh, uh, the um, Armed Forces Chief of Staff, came down to visit and he brought them a recently published volume about the campaign that they were in. It's quite a large campaign, and it's the only South American uh, country that actually has a full volume of military history uh, devoted to it. So, now let's look at what's happened. For, from 1964, when there was a military coup, to 1985, Brazil was ruled by a strong military dictatorship, which was weakened toward the end of that period. Uh, and the first uh, civilian that served after that, or the elected civilian, uh, Tancredo Neves, um, was elected by the Congress. It was an indirect election, but he died before his inauguration. Uh, his vice president, Jose Sarney, whom I had known in Belém, he was governor of a, one of the northern states, became president for four years. And then, um, uh, and then uh, President Kohler was elected. President Kohler was going to be impeached for corruption, and so he fled the country and later was impeached, came back and ran again after his, it was 10 years where he, he had his political rights taken away ran again and was elected to the Senate. And he's still an elected official there. Think about, think about this in terms of how things uh, turn around in Brazil. Um, now, I want to uh, go to the time when I was there because I think this was a watershed uh, period of time. So I um, 
we got to Brazil in um, the summer of 1994. That May, before we arrived there, inflation was at 40% a month. So they have to ke had to keep uh, knocking zeros off the, uh, off the currency in terms of the exchange rate. 40% a month inflation, think about who is hurt worse by that, rich people or poor people? Think about getting your paycheck on the first day of the month and waiting till the last day of the month to spend it. It's 40% less. So if what was happening was galloping, a galloping inflation like a snowball coming down a hill, you had to, if you're a worker and you get a paycheck, you had to take that paycheck and run to the store and spend it all. Otherwise, it was going down day by day. It was the, uh, it was the worst thing that happened to, to workers uh, because the richer people could play the overnight rate with the banks and do all kinds of fancy things with, with bank accounts, but the, but the workers in Brazil uh, were not only hit by inflation, they were contributing to it because they would spend their checks right away. No savings. Uh, and... The president at that time, Itamar Franco, appointed as finance minister Fernando Enrique Cardozo. Fernando Enrique Cardozo put into effect what was called the Real Plan, the Real being the new currency in, in Brazil. And because of uh, the way this was manipulated and because of the, um, an imposed exchange rate within a band, small band, Currency was overvalued. Um, a lot of controls were taken off um, imports. A lot of the tariffs were taken down. A lot of, during that period of time, a good deal of privatization, particularly in uh, areas like uh, telecommunications. Uh, the state-owned uh, uh, industries that it, it should never have been involved in, like the iron, uh, the iron and coal mining uh, in, uh, enterprises. And so, Brazil began to privatize, still with the state at the middle of everything, which is why uh, some people have called this state-led uh, state capitalism. But Brazil began to take a turnaround at the time that Fernando Enrique Cardozo uh, came, to, came to office. I have to say that uh, there was also a turn in the people that were working in the government. The Brazilian foreign ministry during that period of time had been known for being very nationalistic and in a way quite anti-American, or at least anti-American in the sense of resenting the uh, American influence, resenting uh, American culture, uh, thinking that, uh, uh, that we, we as Americans were denigrating uh, Brazil's culture and, uh, and Brazil's history. And Fernando Enrique brought in a new group of more modern, uh, more modern diplomats, and Brazilians do have a very good diplomatic corps, very well trained, well trained in language, languages, uh, well trained in diplomatic skills, and so things began to turn around. We, uh, during the Clinton administration, when I was when I was there, uh, a strong relationship developed between President Clinton and President Cardozo, and between actually uh, Hillary Clinton and and uh, Donna Rucci, as they say, Donna Ruth. Cardoza, who was a Fulbright scholar and a sociologist and quite an intelligent and uh, very active, active woman. So our relationship began to turn around as well. In addition, our, our uh, exports to Brazil went up considerably because uh, their uh, currency was overvalued. It became very cheap to take a trip to uh, the United States, for, and we had hundreds of thousands of people, many of them in long lines in front of our consulates waiting to get visas to be able to travel the United States. The middle class began to grow. Uh, the car industry boomed. We saw this in the period of the four years that I was there, I saw considerable uh, progress. So if we, but if we summarize this kind of history that I've shown you, and I, can we, we can turn that off now, uh, or put the map up, can you do that? Uh, you probably need my, it's under my foot here. So the kind of uh, legacy that was left by this history is the, um, I would say, the love of a strong, aggressive leader, um, a fear of 
uh, inflation. Much akin, I would say, to the Germans with, after the Weimar Republic when German currency became worthless. And so you see this reflected in Germany now in terms of the strong uh, economic policy. And if you look at their relations with Greece now, the sort of resentment for uh, other countries uh, not putting into effect the, the controls and the austerity that they believe is necessary. So this, um, this basically fueled the ability of the Brazilian population to accept uh, the new currency, uh, to accept the new measures, to accept privatization. There had always been a sense that they shouldn't privatize, that it was the, that the Brazilians own these resources. But, for example, in, telecommunications was terrible in Brazil under the state system. You had to wait two or three years, sometimes longer, for a landline in a city like Sao Paulo. Uh, and, a, um, the, and cell phones were not very good at the time. New companies began to, to come in. And Brazil, I, I could, you could feel it even on the roads. There were more cars on the roads. People began, middle class, new emerging middle class began to be able to buy cars. So things were changing. Um, So the lower tariffs, privatized infrastructure, the opening up of telecommunications, informatics, even uh, giving private uh, concessions to roads and railroads, uh, all began to really boost the Brazilian economy. There was also a good deal of reform, which has continued to this day, but continues to present a problem. For example, in the area of pensions, Government workers uh, traditionally could retire very early. You could retire at 50 as a government worker, 45 if you're, if you're a woman, and you got a pension, and a quite a, I would say, substantial pension if you compare it with the basic uh, per capita income of the country. Um, bloated bu bureaucracy uh, with a huge number of bureaucratic rules. Uh, very hard to do business in Brazil or set up a business uh, during this period of time. Uh, and the politics, uh, about 20 to 30 parties, um, almost all of which were uh, represented in the Congress. So coalitions were necessary. And the ability continues to, to today to switch parties very quickly, almost overnight. So you know what that brings. That brings a lot of deals uh, between the various parties to continue the coalition that the president would need. It's not a parliamentary system. The president would need to run the country and get legislation through. Um, in fact, in the last few years of Fernando Enrique's second term, there was almost no legislation. He, uh, he spent a lot of time trying to get a law through that uh, allowed a uh, re-election of the president because there was only one five-year term, uh, but was not able to reform the political system, uh, which basically fuels corruption. And we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. After Fernando Enrique uh, left office, we had an election in which his cohort uh, ran against uh, President Lula da Silva, who was a, a work, uh, uh, metal worker, head of the uh, Workers' Party, uh, thought to be very left-wing. Um, one example, and very suspicious of the United States, so when I got to Brazil, uh, it was right before Fernando Enrique's uh, election, I said to the, um, my political staff, let's see if you can set up a meeting for me with all the, presidential, the main presidential candidates. And everybody agreed. It was just a matter of getting to know them, uh, to understand what, they were, um, what their programs were. The only one who wouldn't meet with me was Lula, uh, because it would, uh, he thought it would damage his image as this... Uh, uh, in, in that area, which was the bastion of uh, leftist politics in, in Brazil. After, when he was defeated, um, I, we tried again, and he actually came over to the residence uh, for a lunch, brought some of his advisors, and I found him very fascinating, very magnetic figure, um, uneducated but very smart, uh, not too talkative, listened, listened, was a good listener, and all this show showed through when he was elected. A lot of people thought he was going to 
ruin the economy by putting into practice very expen expensive uh, social programs to benefit his constituency, which is basically the poor and the rising, the lower middle class. Brazilians have four classes scheduled. making regular visits to the doctor. This has been a tremendous program, uh, and the money, by the way, is given directly to the mother, which I thought was a very smart thing to do as well, because the, the mother was most concerned about the future of the children. That's part of the culture, and the mother was expected to take care of the home, and the mother watched that money very carefully, and she watched what her children did, where they went to school and encouraged them to go to school, stay off the street, uh, in a very, very strong, aggressive way, as Brazilian mothers, uh, as Brazilian mothers can be. Um, Lula also um, hired a uh, central banker. Brazil's central bank, by the way, is not like the Fed because it's still subject to government policy. It's not independent. It's sort of semi-independent. But um, they kept a quite an austere uh, uh, monetary monetary policy and uh, were very careful not to let things get out of hand. So they, they, they kept inflation down at around under 8 9%, which for Brazil was, was quite amazing over that full period of time. Uh, now, get more to get to more, recent, uh, to more recent developments. So Lula had eight, I would say, eight good years, eight surprisingly good years. Many people thought that he would renounce the, the debt, because he had talked about that in previous uh, campaigns, uh, that he would uh, spend a lot of money, that he would have even more bloated bureaucracy. He did none of those things. He did institute some social policies, and he used his charisma to engage the people and to have the people be, I would say, somewhat less cynical about things uh, than they had before. If you talk to working class in Brazil, um, You'll often find a cynicism about government. They, you know, the cab drivers will say, "Well, how are things going? How's the uh, how are, how are your your, gov your how's your governor doing?" And he'll go like this, putting a lot of money in the in his pocket. Or they had a governor I, I knew quite well by the name of Malufi, and um, the the motto that all, they all used is that uh, you know he steals but he makes things run. He gets things to run. Uh, tradition, and in fact. The, that governor who had escaped any kind of difficulty over the years uh, is now uh, under indictment in Brazil. They found his Swiss bank accounts that he'd put his money into. Uh, the Swiss now allow, if you present enough information, they will allow the, bank, the bank, secret bank accounts to be opened. So that uh, situation with corruption uh, and the political system, I would identify as the two things that are holding Brazil back from being the real country of the future. And I want to talk about that a little bit and then open the floor for uh, questions. There have been two really major scandals in the last two years. One is called the mensalão, which means the monthly payment. And what happened, and this happened during Lula's time, by the way, one of the reasons Lula and the, and the uh, Labor Party were elected is because they'd always had a reputation of being an honest party and worrying about government uh, and governing the people properly. Uh, so you had a lot of PT, is the name of the party, a lot of PT mayors in major cities that were quite well respected. Unfortunately, uh, 
It turned out that uh, Lula's chief of staff, a fellow by the name of Deseo, his last name Deseo, um, was actually uh, supervising a scheme to make monthly payments to some of the, uh, the congressmen and the senators to get them to vote in the right way. Uh, to give a little credit to Brazil, although it took seven years, he is finally in jail. Uh, but he is in jail in a certain sort of way. He's out during the day, and then he has to go back at night so he can work at a job. So that's a, not quite the kind of situation where there were millions of dollars involved in this, uh, in this corruption scheme. In any case, uh, a, a judge of the Brazilian Supreme Court took it upon himself to investigate, because the, the kind of system they have is a, ju a judge that is responsible also for the investigation as well as making judgments. Uh, but a judge by the name of Barbosa uh, persisted in this investigation, lasted for seven years. There was a lot of uh, turmoil about this, and finally resulted in the conviction of Deseo and a couple of others. So it was a positive step, at least in terms of Brazil opening up and being somewhat more transparent. Lula's successor, Dilma Dilma Rousseff, a, Bulga a Bulgarian heritage, by the way, um, was elected. Not a real political figure, more of a technician. She had been uh, Minister of Energy. She had worked as uh, Chief of Staff for Lula for a while, very close to Lula. She won the first election very handily. And the last election, which was just uh, last year, uh, which was much closer, but she still won it in a runoff with a uh, more conservative candidate. In fact, the nephew of Tancredo, his name is Ayesion Neves, who is the nephew of Tancredo Neves from the state of Minas Gerais. And that Tancredo Neves was the president I mentioned who died before his, uh, his inauguration. She won that. And, no, and now she is involved in uh, a huge scandal called the Petrelão. That means the big, pet, the big petroleum scandal. Company of Petrobras, which is one of the largest companies in the world, it's a Brazilian state-owned company with some private uh, money involved, uh, turns out uh, to have been involved in schemes that um, uh, involve kickbacks, bribes, uh, transfers of money to the uh, PT itself and other political parties um, in the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. Gilma was um, Minister of Energy at the time and was on the board of Petrobras when all of this happened. And the, way they, the way they got this to happen was that one of the um, people involved in this uh, was caught, um, had good evidence on him, and so he plea bargained and gave a bunch of names. When I was in Brazil just recently, I opened up uh, one of their major newspapers, O Globo, and I was, uh, it, <laughs> it has a headline which says, the president of the Senate, that is the senator who is elected president of the Senate, and the, basically the equivalent of the Speaker of the House are both, uh, both being investigated for having been involved in the scheme. And then when it's, so there's a whole, a whole section on corruption. Um, there's a, there's a 52 deputies are being investigated from the Chamber of Deputies in the Senate. So you might see this as a negative thing. What's happening, though, is something that's very positive. Finally, there are a bunch of young Brazilian federal prosecutors who have gone after these people. And they are turning up evidence. Um, the Supreme Court is going to be involved in a, in a number of cases. There are going to be a lot of uh, politicians who lose their political mandates, looks like. It can't be avoided. And if, if you read the New York Times this morning, there is a front page story on uh, demonstrations at Copacabana, which is the rich area of Rio de Janeiro, uh, basically asking for uh, uh, Dilma Rousseff's uh, impeachment. Brazil's economy is in very good shape, relatively. Things are not going well worldwide. Think of Europe going down. We're doing all right, but our growth rate isn't going to be very high. Brazil's growth rate in uh, 2010, just uh, actually just four years ago, was, was um, uh, 7%. Very nice growth rate. This year, they'll barely reach 1% growth. 
Part of this has to do with the um, world economy. Commodity prices are down, and, and Brazil's biggest trading partner, China, is suffering a, a kind of recession, not importing as much uh, from Brazil, particularly in, uh, in commodities, especially soy and, uh, and rolled steel and, uh, and iron ore. Uh, and they've had a, uh, remember I said hydro is 70% of Brazilians' electricity? Well, they've had a drought that has uh, created big problems. In fact, they've had to go back to traditional methods with, uh, with oil and gas to generate power. So a lot of things have conspired to uh, kind of make things difficult for the Brazilians these days. It's tough times. I don't know whether they're going to be able to reform the political system. It's not in the interests of these deputies. If you look at the, the, the um, career patterns of Brazilian politicians who are senators or deputies, you will find them being career politicians. They, uh, for example, José Sarney, who was president of Brazil. So José Sarney, when I was uh, in Belém, he was governor of a state called uh, Maranhão. When I came back, he was senator from a different state uh, that had been, well, it was a federal territory, Amapá, which was nor north. He had been a judge in the um, state of Maranhão. He had been a federal deputy from Maranhão. Uh, he was president of the Senate, he was, and he was getting four pensions in addition to his salary as, um, as president of the Senate. He was making a pretty good salary for, for a Brazilian politician, upwards of $350,000, making much more than the president of Brazil was making. Um, but, but the pattern is somewhat similar there. Politicians go from one job to another job to a state job, they will be, they, in some cases, they've been a governor of Sao Paulo, has then become the mayor of Sao Paulo, and then been elected to be in the Senate, or run for president, for that matter. So I would say uh, the answer to this particular question, are they going to get there, is are they going to be able to develop a system of civic responsibility which undermines the kind of cynicism that exists in Brazil and undermines what is essentially a huge third economy, that is... A third economy, with GDP in Brazil is $2.3 trillion, which is about eighth in the world. Uh, a th yet another third of that is informal economy, not reported, uh, not taxed. And Brazil has very high tax rates, by the way, on money that is reported. And partially because there's cynicism. Why should we pay, the idea being, why should we pay taxes if we don't get good service for it. The health system's not good. The education system's not very good. If you're a rich person, you send your kids to a, um, a private school, pay for that, and then they get into a free public university. And they're the best universities in Brazil, by far. If you're poor, you send your kids to public schools. They can't get into the public, can't pass the test for the public universities in most cases. There are some exceptions, of course. And then you have to find a way for them to go to, a, if they want to go to the university, go to a private university. What's happened recently, luckily, I think a smart thing to do is the Brazilian government is going to subsidize some of the cost of tuition in the private universities as well, rather than uh, there are this sort of a quota system developing in some of the public universities, but in fact, um, they're going to try to make the private universities better by having a broader representation. So that's one thing. And the corruption. Uh, I hope that this uh, round of federal prosecutors going after the corrupt politicians will so scare the other politicians that it will make politics and make business a lot more honest and much more transparent. So just a concluding remark, and then I'll be glad to answer your questions. Yeah, I think Brazil will make it. Just as ever, in, in the same way that people said, oh my God, the, the World Cup's going to be terrible, and they're building these stadiums, and they're not done. And somebody asked me on a, on a radio program, did I think it was going to work? I said, the Brazilians have a way of making things come out in the end, uh, somehow. Now they're talking about the Olympics, and I'm sure they'll put on a pretty good Olympics as well. So if 
They can tackle these issues. They've got a lot of the economic and social programs in, in, uh, in place now. If they can tackle the issue of the political system and get it reformed, get the number of parties down, make it harder to jump from one to the other, and really go after corrupt practices which add to what's called the Brazil cost, the cost of, uh, of uh, getting things to market, essentially, then I think Brazil uh, will make it. It's an open question. Um, tomorrow they could impeach the president. I don't know what, what might happen there. But I have a great deal of faith in the ingenuity of the Brazilian people. Um, you have a lot of very good middle managers in Brazil and middle managers in industry. Some of them are working in other countries of South America as well. Uh, so I'm optimistic, but I always draw back a little bit with a kind of realistic uh, view based on what history has been since this question of are they going to make it has been lurking around for at least the 50 or 50 years that I've been involved in Brazil. So with that, thank you very much, and I'd be glad to take your questions. <clears throat> Again, Mark is going to be putting up the number to text. If you have a text question, if you'd like to answer, ask a question here, come down to one of the mics and we'll get you in. I'm, I've already had a question or two come through. Um, can you address income inequality? And you talked about that a little bit in your um, right at the end, but does that contribute to it holding back? Is that part of the political system? Is it derived from the political system, or is it its own monster? Well, remember the base is uh, income equality has actually advanced uh, in, in terms of closing the gap has advanced considerably. Um, the lower class in Brazil is, has uh, moved into the uh, into the lower middle class at a very uh, uh, very fast rate. They're talking about 10 percent a year. Now Forbes, for example, says uh, estimates that the middle class in Brazil, especially uh, class C, that lower middle class, is about 50 percent of the Brazilian economy. So that's considerable progress. But there's still you know, we have income equality, inequality as well. There is still a very uh, strong uh, hold on politics by the, by the uh, wealthy class in Brazil. And these are people that are fabulously wealthy. Um, by the way, there was a, there's a very famous Brazilian investor who owned a lot of different enterprises by the name of Ike Batista. Uh, I think he was on the, the uh, billionaire list and somewhere in the first 10 places. Uh, and he actually financed uh, government programs in the favelas, uh, that, uh, uh, partnered with government programs in the favelas. He now has declared bankruptcy. People get very skeptical about this. He says, I have no more money. He had uh, 20, 30 billion dollars, and I, I'm broke, essentially what he said. Uh, people are very skeptical about this. They, th they know or they think the money is hidden in, in various places. But what's happening is more transparency is coming up, and, and the papers are covering this as well. So I think, um, I, and I think and I hope that um, this kind of gap uh, will be narrowed more and more. The government can't do it all. The government uh, sh uh, should be responsible for providing opportunity in many cases, except for the very um, effective program like Bolsa Familia and a couple of others, called, one's called Minha Casa, Minha Vida, My House, My, my Life, where they help finance um, you know, housing and, and, uh, and, and public housing uh, to get people out of the favelas and into better uh, circumstances. If they can find that right balance, um, they will continue to narrow, to narrow that gap. Um, one, Brazil has uh, parts of the economy are very modern. Uh, you've probably flown on Brazilian aircraft, Embraer aircraft. They're short hop jets. They compete with the uh, Canadian company Bombardier, Bombardier, and they um, they sell a lot of airplanes in the United States. Michigan s sends auto parts to Brazil, and Brazil sends auto parts to Michigan. There's a kind of division of of labor going on here as well. Uh, so those sectors of the economy, they have a space program which is pretty modern. I've seen the, the facilities. And if you go through Sao Paulo and some of the companies there, they're quite modern. In some cases, more modern and, and more up-to-date than the United States 
For example, frozen concentrated orange juice. Uh, they got into this when Florida, and I guess it was in the 80s, had five frosts during the, that period. And they needed Brazilian oranges. Brazilians basically abandoned a lot of the coffee plantations and um, began to plant uh, oranges because they were doing well. And if you looked at a can of orange juice, I think it may still have it, uh, Minute Maid orange juice or one of the other, whether the Tropicana, it would say made from a combination of Florida and Brazilian oranges on the bottom. Then, of course, there weren't any frosts in the 90s, so they, the United States slapped a big tariff on the Brazilian frozen concentrated orange juice as well. So uh, the economy's going forward. That will lift you know, some, of, some of the people into the next, into the, uh, into the next category, and maybe out of, out of Class C into Class B. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to Grand Rapids. Your uh, conversations with Chicago or with um, Brazilian yeah. cab drivers remind me of some conversations I've had with Chicago cab drivers <laughs> about their governors in the not too distant past. Anyway, um, there's a perception among many business sectors in the U.S., especially the construction and building materials sector, that Brazil is rich with opportunity, with uh, the major events coming up. But there's probably a, an equal perception that there's it's a an environment even richer in corruption, therefore mm -hmm. not even it worth is. pursuing uh, the opportunities there. The question is, from what sector in the U.S. do you think we can apply the most pressure to try to assist them to, to address the corruption issue, from the diplomatic sector, from the business sector? How might we go about that as Americans? You know, my, my sense of this is, um, of course, practices in Brazil um, Sometimes they would say the, the grease is basic corruption. That's what makes things go. Uh, the government can raise this government to government, but I think it's the private sector. Uh, if, if FDI, foreign direct investment, has gone down, um, there are now I think there are uh, 50 executives from private construction companies that were involved with Petrobras that are under investigation, and there will be indictments as well. How do you, how do you get rid of uh, corruption? You find other opportunities, a country that uh, b is more transparent in the way it does business, uh, a country that take, that it, whose government is not corrupt and who really wants to go after this is, is, uh, you know, is, is a country um, that can uh, succeed in at least wiping out the huge amount of corruption. I don't think that uh, our gov first place, our government is in very good shape with the Brazilian government as a result of the reading uh, President Dilma's emails from, by the NSA, uh, although I guess she's going to finally take her trip to the United States. We'll patch things up a little bit. I don't think we have that much influence over Brazil's practices in that regard. I think what they have to do is learn by better experience. If um, there are countries in the world that are perfectly happy to go along with graft and corruption, and, and it used to be they could take it off as a uh, as uh, off their income tax as a business expense. Uh, but I think the the private sector and exposing what's happening uh, will work its way. It's slow, but it will work its way through the system. And the Brazilian government may realize that it really has to enforce its own anti-corruption laws against. Uh, what are some very influential and big corporations and big contributors to political campaigns. So we can bring it up, uh, but I don't think that government to government is really going to help the private sector. And the more the private sector uh, mentions this, uh, I think the better it will be. But that's not going to completely solve the problem. So you hear a lot about the drug problems mm -hmm. in Brazil. Is um are politics really feeding into that? Like, is that really like a part of the corruption, or is it kind of being swept under the rug and all that? Well, Brazil is now the second largest user of cocaine in the world to the United States. Um, when I was Assistant Secretary for International Narcotics, uh, they really they were a transit country, essentially. It wasn't a big using country. Transit through the Amazon from Colombia, from Peru in some cases, and um, uh, you know, the pattern is the same. Every country that has been just a transit country, think of Pakistan, think of Iran, for example, has become a drug-using country as well. But just one example. 
the largest number of opium and heroin addicts is in one particular country that you wouldn't guess would be that country, Iran. Many more than the United States because the transit from Afghanistan particularly goes through. So what's happened in Brazil is the, um, particularly in the favelas, and because there have been hideouts, non-governed spaces, uh, for the drug traffickers, many of, uh, with ties to the to Colombian, uh, uh, to the Colombian car cartels at first, and then to Colombian mini organizations that traffic, have brought the um, cocaine to Brazil. It's um, it's now endemic. It's it's really uh, solidified into the population, particularly in the um, in the uh, in the poor. Uh, elements of the population. It's become a business in the favelas. The drug traffickers for a long time were running the favelas as if they were a government. Government has now come up with a new scheme that's essentially similar in Rio, especially similar to uh, community policing called the uh, UPP, which means uh, police pacification units. Uh, when we were up in the favelas just recently, we saw them. And, but it's their problem as well. Brazil does not have a tradition of community policing. They have a, a tradition of, of uh, police violence. Uh, they kill in Brazil, I read a figure, of somewhere in the neighborhood of five or 600 times, the police kill five or 600 times as many people in the course of their duties as in the United States. Now, uh, so the combination of first lack of control of the favelas, because some of the governors early on of Rio de Janeiro, and where a lot of the uh, drug traffickers are, uh, basically left them alone, which didn't want trouble. And the fact that a lot of the product stayed in Brazil has created this problem. Um, so, you know, it's it's a dual it's a dual problem. Uh, Brazil also is a, a waypoint for sending uh, cocaine from Brazil through Brazil to Europe now via Africa. So now we have. African countries involved in the route because cocaine use in the United States has gone down considerably. They wanted to make new markets. Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem in Brazil. They, it caught them by surprise. They didn't, you know, if you're going to nip something in the bud, you have to do it pretty early. We found that out ourselves when we were involved in a big crack epidemic in the United States in the 80s. Uh, it just took over in many of the, uh, the central parts of our cities. They have not had a... Um, uh, a very good policy. We tried to do some programs with them and they were resentful of this for a while. They have a very good federal police, but some of the police at the state and local level are both corrupt and very, and very violent and with a great deal of impunity, if you know what I mean. They, they, I remember a television program when we were there and somebody had caught a picture of a policeman grabbing a suspect, taking him behind a car and shooting him rather than putting him into the judicial system. They thought he might be let go. Same thing happened in Colombia. So they have a long way to go on dealing with police impunity as well as the drug traffickers. They kind of feed on each other. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Whether they can solve it or not, I, you know, I'm not terribly optimistic about it at this point. <clears throat> Does the economic instability of Brazil's neighbors help or hinder it? Well, Brazil thrives on markets. If it doesn't have markets for its products, it's not going to go anywhere. It also has a competitive relationship, particularly with, with Argentina, the Mercosul, or Mercosur, uh, which is uh, Brazil, Argentina, um, Uruguay, Paraguay originally, and then with uh, Chile and now, I think, Venezuela in associate status. Um, it hasn't worked out very well. There have been Counter charges and counter charges of violating the rules. Um, so if Brazil's neighbors aren't doing well, it hurts them, but then Brazil can get by better than its neighbors because it has a worldwide, uh, it has worldwide markets for its commodities. The problem is now that commodities are, commodity prices are down and there's not as much, uh, there's not as much demand for commodities. They will probably get through this. Um, they have balanced uh, that part of their economy by doing some both finished and semi-finished products. Like, for example, used to be just iron ore going out of Brazil. They have tremendous deposits of iron ore. But they are also producing rolled steel for the U.S. market. 
Uh, by the way, when I was there, you know, we kept urging Brazil to, in a sort of uh, quiet way, of um, getting more industrialized, partnering more with our companies, uh, and then we uh, we sued Brazil for dumping uh, rolled steel on our market. They took it to the uh, to the WTO. In fact, they've taken us to the WTO on cotton and several other things several times, and have generally won. Uh, you know, on the basis that we were subsidizing or uh, fixing the price of some of these things. They've been very good in economic diplomacy. Um, I guess that's a, that's a positive from the standpoint of the United States. You know, they've, they, um, they have uh, hurt us in the WTO, so I'm not sure how the government looks at it. I wonder if you can comment on the environment there. Uh, use, losing a lot of rainforest to factory farming. You mentioned oranges earlier. A lot of the large factory farms are going down in the Brazil area, and it's taken out a lot of rainforest. I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, well, you know, this started a long time ago. So during the military regime in the, um, basically in the 70s, uh, the northeast part of Brazil is very poor, and they had a program, almost like... Um, homesteading program in the United States to, to attract settlers, or to attract the poor people from the northeast, a place like Recife or on the hump of Brazil, to go into the Amazon, cut down the forest, and then do cattle, essentially do cattle raising. What, the, what happened with that, uh, and I think they learned, they learned their lesson, is that the topsoil of the Amazon is not very, is not very thick, so that after they would um, have they cut down the forest, they have a place for let's say 500 cattle. After five years or so, they could only uh, raise 250 in the same thing, and a lot of that was abandoned. So now you have secondary growth. The other part of it is with this huge, um, uh, with what they call the Cerrado. It's kind of like the savanna in Africa, pre-Amazon area, where they grow a lot of the soy and do a lot of the cattle for, uh, uh, cattle raising. Um, every year it's kind of cut into the edge of the rainforest. It's slowed somewhat. Brazilians have done better. And when we were there, we went to, uh, we had an official, for, uh, the students had an official uh, from the Ministry of Environment who showed that the, the increase was slowing. But every year, part of the, uh, part of the forest is, is cut down. Um, the government has policies. And actually, the laws on the books are quite good. It's implementation. And it's the same thing, there's a lot of wildcat logging that just goes on because the Amazon is so huge, the government really uh, can't police the whole area. And you know, some t you know, I didn't know this, but until I started getting very interested in the Amazon, but things like, for example, mahogany. And there is a mahogany treaty that essentially limits uh, 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 cutting down mahogany trees. Mahogany trees don't grow altogether. They grow in different places. And when they cut a mahogany tree down, which is very valuable, it knocks a whole bunch of other trees down that are not used, that are not used for uh, industry. And there's a lot of wildcat uh, logging going on um, in, the, in the Amazon. The government has turned up some of this. The government has tried to do forest preserves for the equivalent of Indian reservations, uh, put large parts of the Amazon off limits uh, to companies coming in. But it hasn't, it hasn't been able to police all those very well. It's done, a, I think, a sincere job of trying to protect, protect the Amazon, but it's, um, it turns out to be a very difficult job. So I think you know, it's one of those things where the, their heart is in the right place, their mind is in the right place, they just don't have the hands and the brawn to go in and, and really stop a lot of this that's going on. They could, they could stop the agricultural part. The other thing that they do, by the way, is every, um, at the end of the uh, soy season, uh, or whatever crop they're planting, they burn down, they believe it returns, if there's an agronomist here, they believe it returns uh, nutrients to the soil if you burn it down. So you see a lot of stuff going up in the air during the, um, after the harvest. So there's some practices that they probably, you know, would do better to kind of enforce. I was so surprised to learn that uh, Brazil had more slaves imported from Africa than, than we did, and that they uh, freed the slaves later than we did. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wonder how they... 20, almost 30 years later, that's right. I wonder how they've, they handled the race issue, and what is the current status? 
Yeah, this is a this is a big question, and it's a very much of a cultural question. Brazilians think that there is no racism in Brazil, or if they um, talk about racism, they talk about soft racism. Racism. There's harmony between the races. They say um, there's an assumption that um, uh, black people, after all people of color are over 50% of the Brazilian population. This is self-reported in the, in, the consen- in the census, but over 50%. So that, and they grade people by shades as well, which you couldn't do in the United States. How black are you? How pale are you? Uh, yellow colored, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Categories, you know, uh, dozens of categories that they have. Um, but for example, let me give you an example of the, of the way uh, people think about this, since they do not consider themselves racist. So they will admit to some economic issues between people of color and, pe- and white people. When President Cardoza, who is a very fine man and I'm, doesn't feel himself racist at all, was running for office, the issue of racism came up. And he said, and it was in, reported in the newspapers, he said something like the equivalent of, well, all of us, all of our parents or, 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 or grandparents have had one foot in the kitchen. You know what that means? That means, you know, the domestic servants were of color, and their, parent, their parents, their grandparents, etc., had children with, uh, uh, of mixed blood, and he didn't see anything wrong with saying that. Can you imagine? So the concept of racism is quite different there. It's not, and I would say it's not a hard racism. You can see this in personal relationships. On the other hand, you look at the figures. Most of the the highest number of uh, poor people are black, brown, mulatto, however they gauge them, people of color. Uh, Salvador Bahia is is Brazil's blackest state. It has a, a beautiful kind of Afro-Brazilian culture to it with the music and the dance and the food um, and a very high percentage of people of color in, Salva- in Bahia, the state of Bahia where Salvador is, a very beautiful city that has said to have a, you know, these gilded churches, one for every day of the year. There is not one black person on the city council and I think not one in their congressional delega- uh, delegation. And it's a populous, you know, it's a populous place. So, you know, you can, ascri- some Brazilians will say, well, they don't, they being, you know, the people of color, they don't really have, a, you know, a, a tradition of getting involved in politics. So what is it? Is it uh, discrimination and acceptance, or is it acceptance of pl- what your place in society? I don't know exactly what it is because it's quite different than in the United States. There, there aren't big demonstrations about discrimination in Brazil, but it's there, it exists, and um, it's hard to understand uh, given the history that we've gone through, that there isn't this kind of protest movement because if you look at the economic figures, it's very clear what is happening. We have time for one last question. Okay. Quick one. Sure. First, thank you very much for being here. And as to color, we're talking about Michiganders as we conclude our winter. So we're all quite pale. <laughs> My question is as to Mrs. Rosaf, as a female president mm-hmm. and her status in Brazil and her acceptance as to her femininity, how does that play there? And how do you think that might, um, shall we say, reflect on a current American politics uh, as to uh, the next presidential election. Thank you. Yeah, I don't really, I I think there may be some hidden feelings, but in terms of politics, um, the fact that she's a woman and she ran had very, didn't have much effect. I mean, she won the first time, she won by a big margin, and she was against a traditional, uh, his name was Jose Serra. He was a kind of... um, he had been minister of finance, he'd been a senator, he'd been, uh, I think, mayor of Sao Paulo. Later when he lost, he ran for governor, and he was governor of Sao Paulo with a you know, big resume. And she, uh, and she beat him pretty badly. So I don't think it was there. 
Now, because she is now being criticized as being ineffective, not uh, able to get to deal with things, is that going to reflect on her as a uh, as a woman, a female president? And will it have? It's not going to have any effect here in the United States, I don't think. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of women who have been presidents of other countries, uh, going Sri Lanka, for example, India, a lot of. A lot of female presidents, and we have some in our hemisphere, Chile, uh, Argentina, uh, well, Germany, best, uh, I show a personal prejudice here, I think the, the leading statesman, woman, pardon me, statesperson in the world is now <laughs> Angela Merkel, uh, just a side comment. So I don't think, I don't think that, uh, that it matters that much. Brazilians are pretty, um, I mean, there is a tradition of strong, of strong Brazilian women, and, and people, um, Marta Suplicy is, um, is another um, uh, longtime politician. She is now uh, mayor of Sao Paulo. Her husband um, was a, a senator as well. Um, everybody says she's smarter, smarter and more able than her husband. So I don't see anything that, that's there. So last question, but can I say something before? So it's always nice. I love. I like Grand Rapids. I love Ann Arbor. Uh, you know, we've been all around the world, and Ann Arbor is, uh, I guess, our favorite place now. With a nice combination of a lot of things to do in a in a smaller city. We're from uh, Sioux City. Uh, both my wife and I are from Sioux City, Iowa, so we like the Midwest. Uh, but I wanted to mention one thing. A colleague of mine is here, and he's not too far from you. He lives in Holland. His name is Kurt Kamen. He's up here with his wife. Stand up, Kurt, for a minute, because this man had a distinguished career in the Foreign Service. How many embassies? Four? Three. Three. Colombia, Peru, Chile, right? Bolivia. Colombia, Bolivia, Colombia, Bolivia, Chile. You should call on him if he's willing to come down and talk to you. He has tremendous experience. And by the way, we met first in Moscow, at the embassy in Moscow, when we were junior uh, officers, and he had the best Russian of any foreign service officer. He had, I would, he had interpreter level Russian. So you have a very talented person here in your midst. He's very modest, but you might be able to get him to come and, and talk to you sometime. And I think we should applaud him because he's a Michigander. <laughs> so thank you for, uh, for listening to, uh, to me. I hope you will have more Brazil experiences. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Levinsky, for a very comprehensive uh, you know, presentation tonight about the Brazil. So we learned so much about the historical background, the recent development, and the current political, economic, and social challenges of Brazil. So um, we really appreciate you spending time with us and we learned so much. Um, please uh, join me uh, in a, another round of applause for Ambassador Vinsky. Thank you. Yeah. Next week, photojournalist and a Grand Valley State University alumnus, Jared Kohler. He will be here to take us on a journey into the life of a Syrian refugee through the lens of his camera. It will be the very first hand account of the life of Syrian refugees. Please join us for this unique experience on March 23rd. Thank you, and we want to adjourn the meeting right now. Uh, we hope to see you next week. Good night.